If you're not already subscribed to this YouTube channel, go ahead and hit the subscribe button now, along with the bell icon so you can be notified whenever a new video is posted. And if you're already subscribed, check and make sure that YouTube hasn't unsubscribed you. And of course, be sure to give the video a like, as well as share it on your social media. The white supremacists hate that. What do you do when someone you've been abusing and ignoring for decades gets up one day and decides to just walk away? Why you try to entice them back with phony praise and insincere compliments? Elections are transactional. Full stop. You don't do it for ideological purposes. You don't do it for loyalty or to be a team player. You do it as quid pro quo. Something for something. And that something has to be for you. And the terms of exchange are supposed to be worked out long before election day. If somebody comes up to you out of the blue and they start talking about how they need your support for so-and-so election day, that's not the way it's supposed to go. They're supposed to be coming to you before election day. Now, in Virginia, Terry McAuliffe, a longtime Clinton crony, is running to get his old job back as Virginia governor. And while it is important from the standpoint of having themselves a state governorship, the Democrats already have Virginia in the D column. No, this is about something far deeper and far more important. Even the white media has stated that they clearly recognize that Virginia is going to be a bellwether test for the black vote. You see, they're all out of orange-skinned racists that they can use to get black folks to sit on their hands and wait and see if these good white Democrats are going to do anything for us. Black folks started flexing our muscles big time last year and making it clear that our displeasure was going to be felt, and this sent shockwaves throughout the entire political landscape. White supremacy is based on anti-black racism. So, of a necessity, they've got to keep their eyes on us to see what it is that we're doing. We are the single most important indicator of whether or not white supremacy is still stable or whether or not it is under threat. For the last few years, led by the black media, white supremacy has been under active threat, and that threat has only been growing. This just goes to show that no matter how much brave talk and how much phony tough talking that the Democrats and the white media put up last year, they see exactly what the problem is. They should be able to stick their chest out and say, oh, the black vote is firmly back under Democratic control. All that rabble rousing that was going on, well, the black folks, they've turned the corner. They've decided they're going to go back into the loving arms of whatever bootlick rhetoricians get sent out, and the old life has returned. Or at least that's what they were telling themselves. But as usual, we see that the truth eventually has to come out, because reality always gets the last word. And what do we see happening in Virginia? It's coming back to the black vote. Oh, whatever happened to those Latino votes we were hearing about? It's supposed to be more numerous than black people, right? And what about the Asian votes? Ain't that what Andrew Yang was saying? And what has now become quite common in the white media when trying to find a way to report on the fact that black folks are more and more breaking away from the old patterns, the old black baby boomer design, what's happened is the white media has been waffling and they've been giving all sorts of double signals, at least if you take them at their word. If you look at what they say and just take it at face value, then even then you keep getting this contradictory message, everything's just fine, please send help. For example, they were talking about Terry McAuliffe and how he went to a football game at Norfolk State University. And what they were saying was that the black students who were there, they had answers for him before he could even ask for their vote. And McAuliffe was saying, everyone was saying, don't worry, I've already voted, I've already voted. Well, sounds like he's got it all sewn up, right? Except the article immediately says, but McAuliffe can't afford not to worry. Polls have consistently shown him with the overwhelming support of black Virginians, but his victory may hinge on whether this core part of his base shows up in strong numbers to vote. Yeah, that's the problem, isn't it? Getting people who will say, oh, yeah, 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 I just want to get this white man out of my face. So I'll tell them, uh, who are you? I don't even, you want my vote? Yeah, I, I already gave it the office. I already gave it the office. Checks in the mail. Yeah, when they're sitting here, you're at a football game asking people, well, can I can't get you to vote for me? Yeah, what they're going to tell you is, oh, I already voted. Stop asking. Basically, the political equivalent of the checks in the mail. But the problem is a lot bigger than Terry McAuliffe getting blown off at a football game. As the article says, 
President Joe Biden's falling approval ratings and a lack of action by the Democrat-controlled Congress on voting rights and issues important to African Americans could spell trouble in a race with Republican former businessman Glenn Youngkin that already looked exceedingly tight. Biden's approval rating is falling. And the Democrats haven't done anything on issues important to black folks, but this article tries to make it seem as if voting rights is the single most important thing. We're talking about reparations here. Joe Biden got put into the White House without the need for them to pass any voting rights legislation. What it means is, as I've been telling you for the longest time, if black folks want to turn up and turn out, if black folks for real, for real, want to get to those polls, there's nothing that the Republicans can craft in the form of legislation, even if they put every good old boy and racist scumbag in front of the polling, in front of the doors to the polling office. That's not going to stop us. If black folks want to get to the polls, it's going to get done. So talking about we need voting, we're going to have to um, get some rules on the books. Man, the rules wouldn't have stopped black folks in the first place. The Republicans are playing the political equivalent of whack-a-mole when it comes to the black vote. These are just things, even they know that. But it's the white media trying to define what we are saying. They're trying to put words in our mouths. Well, issues important to African Americans, reparations, that check tangibles that's what's important to us but that's not what they're talking about they're trying to divert it and claim that this is what we really want we, we've talked to the black community what they said they're concerned about is lgbt rights and transgender bathrooms they've been trying to find a way to hide behind their own propaganda and it's biting them now, the article quotes someone named Wes Bellamy, who's co-chair of our black party again one of these groups that you and i have never heard of I don't know who the hell's behind him or who the hell they're actually representing, but he does say black voters by and large are feeling like they are being taken for granted. That is hardly a novel concept. That's hardly news. But it does dovetail on a problem that they're just not able to ignore, and that is that there is a serious enthusiasm gap going on. Or should I say that there's a serious fear gap? Because black voters, particularly young black voters, we're talking about the under 40, under 30 crowd here. They're not scared of the orange man. In fact, the idea of scaring young black folks to the polls by telling them be afraid because one of Trump's little wannabe mouthpieces out here, some wannabe Trumpite is going to get into office. That doesn't seem enough to be scaring black folks to the polls. Yeah, as I've been saying and will keep saying, they've run out of orange-skinned racists that they can use to scare a, a critical mass of black folks. Now's the time for all these promises, all this lot of bullcrap that you were talking last year. The black media has made sure that black folks have not forgotten about it. You made all these promises, you ain't come through in a damn one of them. And now here you are, hoping that you can put the genie back in the bottle, put the lid back on the situation. Be afraid, be scared. Well, don't worry about it. We know what you guys were promised and we know what we said, but we can't be worried about that right now. The danger's too great. Why? Why? Don't you know that the nation is on the verge of falling into the hands of fascism? Black folks have been living under white supremacist fascism for 500 years. It's just another day in the life for us. Because the fascism's been coming from both political parties, from both the Democrats and the Republicans. What, you're supposed to sit here and say that there's going to be some white supremacists who want to take power? They've been in control since George Washington. What the hell do you think that slave-owning bastard was? So now you're not going to be pulling the game of, oh, this is different though. These white supremacists, they're not as polite as the ones before them. No, they're honest. And that's fine by me. I'm not scared of an honest white supremacist. Only thing that scares me is if nothing's being done about them. And the Democrats' plan is Negroes should sit on their hands, black folks should just sit on their hands and wait and see if any of these good white supremacists on the left are going to do anything. And of course, they predictably don't. And now a critical mass of us have gotten fed up. And what's the Democrats' plan? They're going to be trying to see if they can soothe all of this anger, if they can talk us to death. As the article says, Democrats have been mobilizing their brightest national stars in hopes of staving off complacency in party ranks, they mean among black people. Vice President Kamala Harris recorded a video praising McAuliffe that will be seen at 300 plus churches statewide and campaigned for McAuliffe on Thursday. Former President Barack Obama will be in Richmond this weekend. They're talking about today. And Biden is coming next week. They're following Georgia Democratic gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams and Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, who each visited black churches last weekend. 
So obviously the idea is they try to flood the zone with notable black politicians, particularly female ones, hoping that there's enough church going black women who will see this and their hearts will go pitter pat and they'll want to live vicariously through these sock puppets. Meanwhile, Stacey Abrams and the soon to be out of office Keisha Bottoms, these clowns are hoping that this is going to be a stepping stone to some sort of higher job position within the DNC party structure. But talk about the wrong tools for the wrong job. You're bringing in Barack Obama, an empty suit who has no credibility and absolutely black folks don't like him and don't trust him. You would have been better off doing nothing at all as opposed to bringing that scumbag. And then you're going to be bringing Joe Biden. But of course, they're going to make sure that wherever they take Joe Biden to, the audience is going to be pre-filtered and pre-vetted. We don't want any black folks who are going to be demanding to know, hey, what about all these lies you told, Joe? Hey, whatever happened to your plans for all these great things you were going to be doing for black folks? Whatever happened to all those promises that you made? Instead, it's going to be no questions, no questions. Y'all just sit there and clap on cue. Black folks need to do what they did at Brown Chapel AME Church in Selma when they stood up and turned their backs on Mike Bloomberg. That's what needs to happen to Jim Crow Joe. Show that the black vote already made it clear we put your behind on the White House. It's time for you to pay us back through policy. And you ain't done it, and we recognize exactly what's going on, and now you are facing an open revolt from inside the big house. As Dr. John Henry Clark put it, a revolt in the servants' quarters. But imagine that. Kamala Harris, Barack Obama, our two immigrant biracials fill-in-the-blanks, Joe Biden, a career white supremacist, Stacey Abrams and Keisha Bottoms, two political prostitutes whoring themselves to the DNC in the hopes that they can get themselves a job. And this is who they're bringing. Because this is all they got. Now, of course, the answer to the problem that they have is you got to start putting some tangibles on the table. But that's exactly the point. There will be no tangibles on the table. That's exactly what they're trying to get away from. McAuliffe has a so-called plan for black Virginians that he calls lift up black Virginians. Lift, huh? That sounds so familiar when you use that word, but I just can't remember where I've heard it before. Oh, yeah, that's right. It was Biden and Harris's pathetic lift every voice scam that they were talking about last year. Oh, but they ain't been talking about it since, though. As soon as he got that election victory, lift every voice. What what, what, what the hell are you talking about? It's not just his creeping senility, which is now a full-blown rampaging senility that's caused him not to talk about it. He doesn't remember it because he doesn't want to talk about it. Oh, yeah, he remembers it all right, but as far, as far as he's concerned, out of sight, out of mind. And you don't hear any of these black mouthpieces saying, hey, before we go talking about what black folks are going to do for Democrats next year, let's talk about all that stuff that you guys said you were going to do for us last year. You're in office now. And you ain't done a damn thing. They all promised that they would do something, though, as I explained when I read the Lift Every Voice plan to you, it was for minorities and people of color. That's what Lift Every Voice was about, and Lift Up Black Virginians, Terry McAuliffe's little rebranded variation on the exact same talking points, the same damn thing. There's going to be a $15 an hour minimum wage. So we can see the career Clinton flunky McAuliffe who is selling the same snake oil with almost exactly the same name. And yet we're supposed to believe that the results will be different from him, Right. The article goes on to quote Mr. Bellamy of Our Black Party as saying, when you look at national politics, when you look at some of the things that the Biden campaign promised but not quite delivered on yet, I think there will be some trickle down effect. He's talking about in terms of political difficulties for the Democrats, that because of the failures at the national level, which are the same as the failures at the local level, it's not as if Democrats have been doing things for black folks locally, but this is trick language here. Oh, well, well, you see, the problem is when black folks are thinking about Biden. No, the problem is when they're thinking about Biden, when they think about McAuliffe, when they're thinking about Keisha Bottoms, when they're thinking about any of these corrupt and crumbling Negro bootlicks up and down the ticket. Doesn't matter if it's the empty suit president or all the way down to the Democratic dog catcher. Black folks have seen nothing but complete and thorough malign neglect. Ain't a damn thing benign about it. This is malignant neglect. 
Specifically looking at black folks and going, we're not going to do a damn thing for you. We'll lie to your faces and then turn right around and tell you vote for us, stupid. And that's what they're doing. This is a mass IQ test that's being administered. And a lot of black folks are failing it. But this Bellamy character, he's sitting here saying some of the things the Biden pro campaign promised but not quite delivered on yet. Not quite delivered on? To say that a politician has not quite delivered on something yet, that's like saying that you've got a little cancer, or you're a little dead, or you're a little pregnant. You're just a little dead. He hasn't quite delivered on it yet. What the hell has he delivered on for black people in any shape, form, or fashion, to any capacity? Name a damn thing that he promised to black people that he's actually made good on. Not quite delivered on yet. Yeah, that's a that's the the kind of wording that you get from one of these Negroes who's holding out the pathetic hope that he's going to get a consulting gig or maybe he'll get featured on MSNBC and maybe that'll be the start of some sort of cable news pundit job for himself. Not quite delivered on yet. No, the phrase you're looking for is he hasn't done a damn thing for black people. That's the phrase I think Mr. Bellamy was really looking for. Because that actually reflects what has happened, or should I say, what hasn't happened. And what does Terry McAuliffe have to say for himself? Yet again, as I told you before, the only thing he has to say for himself is, well, black voters know that when I was governor, I restored voting rights for many former Virginia felons. Once again, whenever you talk about black folks, it's always the crime blotter. Whenever they're talking about black folks, it's always, let's talk about crime and criminality. Those are the only issues that black people are concerned about. Well, black issues have to do with whether or not they're going to get the right to vote because they're all criminals, you know. Nothing about tangibles, nothing about putting something in my pocket. It's all about, well, let's talk about black folks and let's talk about, go ahead and talk about the crime issue. Let's talk about crime. That's, what, that's a black issue, crime. That's Terry McAuliffe. And the only reason they were talking about that, the only reason that, that was even on the radar, is because that's something for themselves. That's the Democrats giving themselves a gift and then turn around and telling you that it was for you somehow. Now, the article quotes a Cliff Albright, co-founder of Black Voters Matter. Again, another one of these organizations. We don't know who they are, who the hell's funding them, never heard of them before. But the white media is going to quote them because, well, apparently these guys are safe Negroes to be talking to. But even they have to admit Democratic outreach efforts in Virginia have generally been late and underfunded and have relied too heavily on things like ads instead of on-the-ground outreach. That's one of the things, see, that Barack Obama at least proved to him. There is no substitute for shoe leather. There's no substitute for banging on those doors. And these guys, though, they're only giving mouth service to what the black grassroots have been saying all along. Carpet bombing us with a bunch of ads, that ain't going to cut it. That's not a substitute for doing what we said. They know what the issues are. They know what our concerns are. They know what our interests happen to be, and we've been telling them. And they're trying to figure out how do we get around that. I know we'll do some razzle-dazzle ads and try to get you excited about voting for someone who ain't going to do a damn thing for you. Mr. Albright says that bringing in Democratic standouts, that is these black bootlick shills, let's call them what they are, bringing in Democratic standouts likely wouldn't be enough to correct that, he predicted. Quote, pulling in new infrequent voters, it's going to take more than a couple of visits. It's really going to take creating some type of excitement at the grassroots level, and ideally some excitement that's around policy that people feel passionate about and feel like is really on the line. Now, there's a little bit there that needs to be unpacked. First of all, Mr. Albright, sounding just like Mr. Bellamy, he's using these words that are basically meant to say that we're towing the Democratic Party line, that things are basically going their way. At least we don't use any sort of language that would be threatening to them. Pulling in new infrequent voters. You want to know why it is that they're infrequent? It's because of the fact that the neglect of the black community and the complete and thorough lack of results for their vote has been thoroughly consistent. You want people to vote consistently, they got to see consistent results. And if the only consistent result they've seen is nothing, then what happens is it's going to be very difficult to tell them that voting is worth their time. People aren't stupid. Well, at least not enough of them are as stupid as people like Bellamy and Albright need them to be in order to go along with what would be in their own personal would-be consulting job interests. He is right, though. It's going to take more than a couple of visits. But the thing is, if all you're going to do is bring in a couple of high-profile bootlicks, that ain't going to cut it. 
the Democrats need to generate some excitement about policy. But as the Democrats made clear with their confidential memo during the BLM rallies, the Democratic politicians have been explicitly instructed to make no promises. Y'all remember that memo? Say, listen, go ahead and tell them you care, but do not make any promises. Because promises has to do with policy. That means talking about policies with black people is off the table for the Democrats. This is all about trying to figure out, can we do everything short of actually doing anything for you? Let's get you to clap. You guys, we know how you Negroes are. You're like a bunch of big kids. We can, all we have to do is get you a little bit excited with some hooping and hollering. And we got to get make it like some sort of screwed up football game. We're going to do a pep rally and off to the polls because you guys have the memory of a gnat on meth. You won't remember anything five seconds later. At least that's what the hope is. And because in too many instances, black people have shown that we would fall for that. But the question is, is this new day that's been dawning, is this simply a flash in the pan or is this the new normal? That's what they're scared of. So they're flooding the zone. They're flooding the zone with all these career bootlicks and hopefully this is going to change something or at least sustain something. Their strategy is going to be to bring in all of these hand-picked Negroes who the white media made prominent and have them cheerlead for McAuliffe and Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden and tell us how important it is that we vote. What it means is how important it is that we stop rocking the boat. You can no longer sit here and start pushing your interest and start making demands and making it clear this is what the black vote is based on. Black people have no issues. Black people have no interests. At least that's the narrative that they're hoping is going to take hold. What's going on now is a tug of war. It's a push-pull struggle between the black media and the white media and the influence that we can have, hopefully, on black people in this country at large. Now, the black media and the black grassroots that we represent, we're bringing about a political realignment within the black community. Because for the last 70 years or so, black folks in this country, at least as a voting bloc, we've been a personality-oriented constituency ever since basically the days of Franklin Roosevelt. You didn't have to do anything for black folks. You just brought about some gregarious white man who gives some empty bluster. And if he has himself a gaggle of Negroes sitting there like a bunch of magpies nodding their heads and going, yes, boss, you're all right, then black folks would fall for it. We're making it clear that this new burgeoning black voter base is a policy oriented constituency. We don't give a damn what you say or what bootlick you bring in to say it. We only care about what you do. Scaring us to the polls, that's a losing proposition. As Stokely Carmichael said, all the scared niggers are dead. We know what's going on. This is about getting us to go back to the political treadmill to nowhere by bringing in some blowhard bootlicks who ain't going to promise us anything. We've told them what the policies must be. We've told them what our interests are. And all of this, well, we're going to say that the interests are some voting rights bill and, and transgender bathrooms, and, and we're going to have some hazy, insincere, very indistinct talk about police reform. The police require punishment, not reform. But that's the game that they're playing. And police reform always takes the form of, we need to give the cops more money. Tell us what's in the interest of continuing white supremacy and then have their puppet politicians say it's going to benefit us without ever telling us how it will do that. And then when nothing changes, they tell us that it was all our idea. That was actually done earlier in this article. Terry McAuliffe was talking about how it was the black folks, apparently in the state legislature, the black caucus of the Virginia state legislature, who, as he put it, recruited him to run for office. That's the way that he tries to tell the story. That apparently there were just these Negroes in the state legislature who just could not bear the thought that Terry McAuliffe wasn't going to be running again. They, they wanted him to run. And he was able to beat the top three black candidates in the Democratic gubernatorial primary because apparently that's what black folks want. This is more of that crap that Bill Clinton was doing. Hey, Bill, ain't you going to explain about the 94 crime bill that you signed that you were all happy about? Well, well, you know, it, it wasn't me. It was those black preachers. You see, the black preachers, they were the ones who wanted all you niggers locked up. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. That's the game. They do their dirt. Make sure that they keep one of their pet mascot Negroes in tow. 
and then turn around and say, well, it was you black folks. This is what you black folks wanted. Why are you black folks? You just strong armed me into it. You didn't even give me a choice. So since the charm offensive is falling flat and the cheerleading offensive is clearly more sizzle than steak, white supremacy being sophisticated, they know that they've got to take both sides of the argument. That's why they bring in their black votes matter and they bring in their black this and black, these organizations with these names you never heard of before, but they put black on the front of it. So that's supposed to make you think that, oh, well, obviously these guys must be for us because they got some black front person saying that our black party, black votes matter, black pack, etc., etc., and all of them saying the same thing. How do we go back to voting for nothing and feel better about it? Well, we know what our policies are. We know what our interests are. And at the forefront of it is reparations. That's at the top of the freaking list. But of course, the white media being sophisticated, they want to make sure that they stake out territory on that particular issue too. We've already shown in 2020, that's going to be a primary issue. That's going to be a prime issue. You're not talking around it. So you got the San Francisco Chronicle. Oh, yeah, you better believe the crap is coming in hard and heavy. This is Kamala Harris's home turf. So the little propaganda mill out there, they start off their little article about reparations in California, and they're saying, here's what that could look like. Now, you got a bunch of white folks writing this garbage. So you got white folks talking about what California owes black communities, and here's what it should be. So already... This article positions itself as nothing but empty propaganda meant to mislead us to do something that's in the interest of white supremacy. And they start off with a complete and th with half a lie. Each year starting in 1989 until his death in 2019, John Conyers introduced H.R. 40 to establish a commission to study and develop a patch. Blah, 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 blah. Give me a break. H.R. 40. Talk about your quintessential do-nothing legislation. That's the re There's a reason why, for three decades, the bill went nowhere, because there was nothing to it. It was meant to give them a talking point so they could say, why, why, reparations? We, it's not like we're afraid to talk about it. Why, we've had this bill from John Conyers that's just been gathering dust for three decades, and he didn't seem to be very bothered by that. The Congressional Black Caucus didn't seem to be very bothered about that. No one made it a point that ain't no business going to get done unless H.R. 40 moves forward. So obviously that lets you know how important it was, or rather wasn't, to even the congressional black talkers. I mean, a caucus. But this article in particular, this is more of that talk about how the reparations issue should be handled locally. We Local focus on reparations, local focus. Well, that's all well and good, except for one small problem. When you actually read the article, what you find is their idea of focusing on it is to talk around it. After they give the same usual dry recitation of just one or two of the economic wrongs inflicted upon us, particularly redlining, then when it comes time to talk about what their ideas are from the San Francisco Chronicle for what reparations could look like, they give just one sentence to the idea of paying the victims money. In fact, they didn't actually say money per se, but it did say monthly payments, comparing it to what post-World War II Germany did in regards to Holocaust victims, making monthly payments. Okay, that's a good start, but we need to go ahead and make it sure that that's exactly what it's going to be. The Jews did not have some trust set up, and then, you know, maybe there'll be something down the line, but it's going to be administered by some third party. They said, no, cut them the check, and that's what it was. So they start off by saying reparations should be like what happened for the Jews in Germany after World War II. Holocaust victims, okay, n now you're talking, and then in the very next sentence, they immediately switch, and they don't come back to talking about paying money anymore, not to, uh, not to individual victims. They don't talk about that anymore. They switch it and say, beyond individual payments, a trust fund supported by government and private institutions, such as banks that benefited from redlining and predatory loans, could finance a broad range of societal remedies. Hmm... That sounds more like some do-nothing democratic plan. Maybe this, maybe we should call California's idea lift every vote. Such a trust could help black Californians put down payments on homes or pay for college education. The fund could also help support California's one historically black educational institution, 
Well, that didn't take very long, now did it? We immediately switched from a World War II style payments to the victims of slavery to a trust fund, and it's going to be money for a possibly a down payment on a home, or you can pay some tuition, and the HBCUs could get some money. In only two sentences, we went from individual payments to immediately talking about putting money into a trust, which means black people can't get it. And then it's the same old litany of the same old do-nothing talking points. This is what the white media wants. Reparations should be, well, you can have some money to put to a down payment on a home. That means the money goes to the banks, the same banks who redlined black folks in the first place. Well, how about money to pay for a college education? Well, this article already says California only has one HBCU. So the chances are better than 95%. You're not going there. You're going to be going to some state college that's going to be putting money into the hands of white folks. Gee, these reparations seem to be more for white people than black people. It's not anything that black people are going to be able to keep. You don't get to keep the money that they're giving you so you can give it to some bank's mortgage division. You don't get to keep the money that they give to you so you can pay some tuition. You don't get to keep that. That's not something that goes in your pocket. You can't put that in your bank account. So what they're saying is go into massive debt to get a home or some education And the government will hand you a voucher that you can't even put in your own bank account. You're not going to, there's no way that you can take the money and put it in your own bank account to use it for whatever you feel it would be best used for, like say starting a business. Instead, no, this is not money for you. This is just money so you can choose what white bank or white college or university that you want to give the money to. What kind of reparations is that? That doesn't make you whole. That doesn't repair you. That doesn't make black people any richer, though it does make white banks, white mortgage companies, and white universities a lot richer, which is the entire idea. And as far as money for HBCUs goes, hmm, the less said about that one, the better. Because we all know what a sham these HBCUs are. But then they go from the merely counterproductive to the outright self-destructive. They talk about reparations funding could be used to further the essential work of national memory and education about America's original sin. Support could go to cultural institutions like San Francisco's Museum of the African Diaspora or for street art commemorating black lives lost to lynchings or police violence in California. A trust fund could also support retraining for local police. So, how do we repair the damage done to black people as a result of slavery and the the subsequent economic and political and social repression and brutalization that we've suffered ever since? Give money to San Francisco, which, by the way, has basically gentrified almost all the black people out of the city. San Francisco, you can give money to these white folks who are running this Museum of the African Diaspora, the city, so the city gets that, and you can pay white artists to put up some street art so we can go ahead and be reminded of the black folks who the thugs in blue have murdered, which for them count as trophies. Yeah, remember that nigger who we killed and this other one over here that we killed, we got away with it. Oh, and speaking of black lives lost to police violence, we can go ahead and make sure there's a trust fund set up so the cops can have the latest state-of-the-art equipment and, and weapons so that they can kill more black people. Johann Meserly murdered Oscar Grant in cold blood. That wasn't due to a lack of training. Any talk about the police that does not begin and end with punishment is illegitimate. The only way that police should be mentioned in a reparations conversation is to discuss the police unions being forced to divest themselves of the money that they have had ill-distributed to them from the black community who they've been attacking for over two centuries. That's the only talk that we should be hearing about the police. Slashing those bastards' pockets, the police unions being made to divest themselves of their ill-gotten gains. Now I'd be in favor of that retraining them, re- give me a break. So you got Joe Biden saying, um, police reform, more money for the cops. And you got the San Francisco Chronicle, you know, Kamala Harris's paper of records saying, reparations could be a trust fund so you can give money to the police. This is your white liberal media, so-called white leftist media saying this mess. This is what we're told the white media would like for us to take up as reparations for us. They preach the exact same line of crap that you get from the right. 
if there's going to be money going to black people, well, it needs to be under the control of white people. And the very white people who have been attacking us, they have to get money too. The banks got to get some money. The colleges and universities that have been just turning black folks away or jacking up the tuition so as to so as to bankrupt black people, they should be getting money. And the thugs in blue have been murdering black people in the streets. We need to make sure they get some money too. This is part of the white media's ongoing war to redefine what reparations is. This is the narrative they want out there. A self-fulfilling prophecy meant to maintain the status quo. They invent a phony definition of reparations, which simply means money for white institutions, particularly the ones that have attacked black people. And then they have their black bootlicks on cable like Joy Reid and Tiffany Cross or in print like Ta-Nehisi Coates say that this is what black folks need. And then you'll have a few of these phony baloney pretend black organizations, Black Packer, She the People, or the National Black Justice Coalition, just some phony group the white folks gave some seed money to so they can have some black sock puppets to repeat and parrot their gibberish. These are the individuals who are going to be signing off on it and saying, well, it's a good start. It's just a first step. We got to start somewhere. When, of course, it's not the beginning of anything. It's the end of it. It's the end of the road. It's going to begin with giving money to the very white racists who have impoverished black people and exploited us and brutalized us and murdered us in the streets. And it's going to end with them getting money. It's going to be also end with black folk going, well, when do we get something? This is meant to dial us in for another 30 or 40 years of running in place. That's why the white media makes its point to falsely claim that people like Ta-Nehisi Coates single-handedly brought reparations to the forefront of the political discussion in America. That ain't true. That's the reason why Ta-Nehisi Coates had no problem going to Congress and talk about everything except for a check. It would be one thing if you had these do-nothing Negroes saying that the first thing that's got to happen is we got to be cut a check. Money must change hands, specifically to us. No trust funds, no anything of that. All we got to do is prove lineage, and after that, here's my check. Go, here's my bank account number, just like the IRS. You, When it comes time for your tax return, all they need to know is what's your routing number and your bank account number. All right, then. Here we go. Same thing. But, of course, it would be one thing if they said, well, well let's talk about that check first. And then after we've gone ahead and gotten it straightened out how much money's about to change hands, then we can talk about some of this societal stuff. No money for the cops, though. We can have money for people to make sure that they are armed with the tools of self-defense just in case they run into the next racist with a badge. But we're not talking about no money for the police. And as far as money for street murals and such goes, uh, you let the black community decide what they're going to do with that. But what's going to happen first is this check. That's what's going to happen first. But that's not what happened. They just said, we're going to go ahead and bypass the issue of a check, and we're going to talk about everything except for that. You think that was some sort of coincidence that he did that? You think it was some sort of accident? All of them were on the exact same page. Because this is all part of a coordinated effort to redefine reparations so that they can pay white interests and institutions our money. Then they will claim that reparations, the original sin, has finally been dealt with and then when black folks point out, hey, ain't a damn thing changed, they'll turn around and blame us and say, well, we don't know what the hell's wrong with you people. Why we gave you money. Look at all the money we gave you. We gave you money. We gave you people money. Why we gave you money so you could put a money on a down payment on a home to, through a white mortgage company. And we gave you money so you could go to university, a white university. Well, why we even gave you money so that the police could have more weapons to kill you with. That's the game that they're setting up. It's not supposed to change anything. That's the point. You got the white media who has been pushing this lie across the board. Those three things in particular. Well, well, what about um, paying for a home or, or putting a down payment on a tuition and making sure the cops have more money? They keep pushing that over and over again. So you know that this is a coordinated effort. This is deliberate. This is not just something that they happen to be saying coincidentally. This is a message that the white media wants out there. The white powers that be want that out there. So hopefully that takes hold. After they have tried to invent and manufacture a reparations definition that has nothing to do with black people, then the idea is to hammer it as much as possible and try to give it legitimacy. So you have some black bootlicks out there saying, yep, 
This is all right. This is what reparations is. This is what we need. Okay, maybe the 99.9% of black folks don't like it, but you know what? It's a first step, and well, we got to start somewhere. The same crap that you heard last year when it came time to talk about Biden being voted for for president, when it came time to talk about the black vote in Biden, what did we hear? Lesser of two evils, got to start somewhere. It's the same old game. And you have so-called white leftists leading the charge. So when it comes to us, there's no such thing as the white right and the white left. As they see it, it's just white versus black, period. So the carpet bombing of the black polity has only just begun. Bringing out their paid prostitutes to call themselves, telling us we need to get to the polls for their behalf and their benefit. Barack Obama, of all people, bastard didn't do a damn thing for black people. He had, with a smile on his face, I'm going to sign this blue alert executive order. I want the cops to know we're back in the badge. Well, what about an executive order that's going to make it where the Justice Department's top priority is going to be prosecuting the police? Well, we can't, we can't do that. I mean, all the, Hillary needs to get reelected so that I can have the capstone on my legacy. I want to be able to say that I'm the first president since Democratic president since FDR to be able to successfully hand the White House over to another Democrat. That's all he was thinking about. Barack Obama, the mountain climber. But of course, when that didn't happen, the little salty bastard has had his nerve. Well, Y'all need to secure my legacy. No, Obama, your voters are all in the grave. You let all your voters get killed. But it's our job to keep up the steady drumbeat. This is about pushing and pursuing black interests. And those black interests are economic, full stop. It is for us and what's going to go into our pocket. Ain't going to be none of this trust fund stuff. Ain't going to be none of this held in escrow stuff. Ain't going to be none of this, well, here's a voucher that you will hand to a white organization, to a white bank, to a white institution. No, this is about what goes in my account. This is what goes in our pockets, not what it is you're going to hand to us so we can immediately hand it to someone else. In fact, forget about hand to, you never even get a chance to have it. That's how it works with all these things. It's like getting a um, car loan. They don't actually hand you a envelope with thirty thousand dollars in it. They tell you, "Well, here's a document that you sign, and now you, now we basically own you until you pay this debt to us." So it's a very hyper aggressive effort to try to take the interests of black people, the issues of black people, our real interests, to first of all try to pervert them and redefine them as something that is disadvantageous to us. And then try to come up with so-called policies that are going to be completely and thoroughly injurious towards us and detrimental towards us. And the same Negroes who you see who are out here claiming that they're somehow speaking for us, they'll be the same ones who are giving a tisk tisk and basically blaming us when all this crap predictably doesn't produce anything. They won't be pushing back. They won't be doing what you see the black media doing and pointing out, whoa, these scams and such, this is not helping black folks. It's helping out the same old white institutions, the very ones who enslaved black people, the very ones who have economically deprived us and who murdered us. They don't talk like that. They're not going to. Because the Keisha Bottoms and the Stacey Abrams and the rest of them, they're all trying to get a job. They made their minds up a long time ago. They made their peace with the idea that their job is to preside over the complete and thorough liquidation and elimination of black people in this country, and they're just going to be using us as a hobby horse to get to where they want to get to. Their true constituency is not black people at all. Their constituency happens to be the Nancy Pelosi's and the Chuck Schumer's and the white power brokers on the left. That's their real constituency. That's who they actually work for. That's whose interests that the Stacey Abrams and Keisha Bottoms actually want to represent. Well, we got to push back and hard. This may not be the sexiest of things for black folks to be talking about, because usually black folks, they give the most attention to anything that has to do with gossip or celebrity. We're very big on infotainment. But infotainment is not going to save you. Infotainment is not going to make sure that our people do not fade from this earth. Infotainment is not going to put gas in your fuel tank or put food in your belly. Infotainment is not going to secure your future or that of your children. We got to start getting serious and being mature about what it is that we want, what's in our interest, and how hard we're going to fight in order to get it. Now, there's also something else that needs to be mentioned. There's going to be a significant change to this YouTube channel starting November 1st. I'm not quite at the point where I'm ready to share all the details yet, but I think you're going to like and appreciate the changes that are going to be made. So until then, watch this space. And as always, family, be about the business.